Hello, I'm Stuart Pallister, uh, former journalist and editor turned communications practitioner in higher education. Uh, welcome to Leading Hospitality Through Turbulent Times. This series is called The World After 2020 and we're now halfway through the series. Uh, we changed the format slightly. The sessions are now one hour in total and um, we'll have questions after about 25 minutes and uh, five minutes or so for questions right at the end. We'll be taking questions in writing only and you can submit these as we go along. Uh, before we start, just a reminder that the session will be recorded and will be available on the Moodle platform afterwards. So I'll hand over now to Professor Yi Shimei, who specializes in global and comparative politics. Professor Shimei. Thank you, Stuart. Thank you very much. And uh, welcome back to uh, all those who already uh, shared uh, this uh, course earlier. We are now halfway. Uh, so one month and uh, two parts. So that's a uh, great uh, progress. Uh, well, I hope so. So the, today uh, we are going to address a particular issue, which is diplomacy and democracy are uh, facing deep crisis everywhere and uh, probably at the global level this impact the way uh, we may find solutions to uh, current uh, events like the uh, pandemic and, and, and possibly other pandemic in the future. So as you see on this uh, uh, nice uh, cartoon, uh, the Trump presidency uh, changed a lot of uh, uh, of, of, of things which were considered as take, which were taken for granted by a number of states uh, until then. And uh, it's also a question mark because we don't know what will uh, come out from from many Trump decisions um, and uh, in particular with, with multilateral organizations, which is something that we will address in the next session actually. So our question is, is, are diplomats and uh, Democrats uh, today in jeopardy? I mean, they have been uh, the roots of uh, the globalization processes uh, for centuries. Um, and uh, now on, uh, there is a question about uh, uh, if you uh, get out of the tracks uh, of diplomacy, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble because the people who had the legal status, who were legitimate enough to rule the world uh, and were respected by everyone and of course had uh, immunities, protections, etc. Uh, were people who uh, take um, a big share in uh, the globalization process and the earliest waves of globalization like uh, travelers, of course, uh, mainly uh, mobility mattered, managers who uh, opened new um, uh, new firms and, and uh, had new businesses, uh, etc. Diplomats, of course, and also democratic leaders, because, you know, a world where people can move uh, freely and easily from one country to another is a world in which a number of countries are democratic, are democratizing and opening up. So, well, today, uh, such uh, um, agents and, and sometimes leaders uh, are more or less replaced or uh, they uh, just uh, are sidelined by other uh, sometimes heroes. And there is a migrant or refugee day, a refugee, there are refugee heroes at the World uh, uh, Organization for Migration, for example. But uh, most of the time, people who uh, are uh, raising quite a number of, of problems for a, a harmonious global society like uh, migrants and refugees, refugees, internet users when they uh, misuse the internet uh, like hackers, whistleblowers because of course after uh, they have uh, warned the world about something uh, they had uh, uh, leakages of uh, confidential documents etc. Uh, there is a big mess in the aftermath extremists and, and of course terrorists and also smugglers, poachers, traffickers, etc. All those who profit, benefit from the uh, um, mobility uh, of a number of people who do this illegally uh, to make money. So the question is who actually rules globalization by now? And to answer this question, uh, we must first evaluate the evolution 
of the agents of globalization because civil servants, who, those who were uh, um, on top of the uh, uh, administrations, bureaucracies, international organizations, uh, which in the past used to rule globalization in a way, tame it, moderate it, frame it, etc. Um, these people are not as powerful as they were in the past. So their authority, for example, is uh, declining compared to uh, other emerging professions, mainly in finance, but of course in tourism, because as those who are um, probably the most uh, involved in making business for a number of countries, like for example today Greece uh, and even Italy, are people who organize tourism and make tourism uh, tourists come over and visit uh, in Greece, uh, probably in some uh, localities and islands, uh, 90 percent of the uh, uh, of the uh, revenues uh, are made uh, of, of, of tourists. So if you don't have tourists, uh, you just die. So what are the respective roles of the people who were prominent in the past and the people who are emerging today? Of course, uh, the challenges that they face are increasingly uh, uh, demanding and uh, challenges uh, are empowered compared to those who were there, uh, not for etern from eternity, but were there from a long period of time as uh, diplomats, uh, actually. The, now, of course, as in the past, borders are crossed, but they are increasingly called, crossed. And at some point, you figure out that probably they don't even exist. I mean, there are quite a number of uh, customs uh, um, uh, booths uh, that are abandoned everywhere in Europe, for example, and they are still there uh, on the road. Uh, and you just pass by them uh, on the highway without stopping because there's, it's, there is no one to make any control on whatever you want to smuggle from one country to the next, which would be forbidden as an import in uh, the country you are going to visit. In democracies, uh, there are a number of uh, jobless people, unfortunately, but uh, the uh, those who would like uh, to uh, find a job uh, in a, a country to which they try to to the, which they, they, tr they try to reach uh, uh, illegally are uh, held by traffickers, but uh, uh, and traffickers are not, not stopped by, by border inspections. They can uh, be warned and they can do, um, they, can, they have some, some, some policies uh, or protocols to uh, escape any type of control most of the time. Even separation fences uh, uh, might be very high, like eight meters high uh, and very long, like uh, dozens of kilometers, uh, do not actually uh, deter them to organize the traffic and, and people pass. Um, and that's, uh, of course, a problem for democratic countries like uh, the USA, uh, Europe, uh, etc. But it's also a problem uh, in uh, countries where uh, the uh, the democracy is, 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 is actually not as uh, important uh, and then people are not as democratic and the institutions are not. Uh, or, or, or countries and cities in uh, countries which are uh, on principle, on paper, democratic, they are mafias and the mafias are those which control the exchange of products and people with the other, the outside world, in particular democracies where uh, people can take refuge and uh, um, and find a job. Illegal groups, uh, of course, are more authority, are more powerful uh, in uh, a situation of authoritarian, authoritarian rule, like uh, in Russia, in Turkey, or in China, where you have triads. Uh, although the Communist Party is so powerful, uh, acting under cover in these cases is tolerated by the power because uh, it's in a way. A, 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 a solution to a number of uh, local uh, issues which had, have to be settled and uh, the uh, central authorities have no resources uh, to do that. So they can in a way delegate uh, the power to control uh, local um, illegal people uh, by illegal means. Uh, and so that's not, it has no political impact. I mean, it's not going to change the, the government. And so it's tolerated. Uh, of course, the less diplomatic and 
democratic leaders are, the more illegal groups feel free to act because uh, uh, there is no uh, incompatibility, inconsistency between their uh, freedom of maneuver uh, at a very local level and uh, the uh, reputation, uh, the recognition of the whole state, um, uh, which may rely on its capacity to show that it controls its population without uh, by legal means and not by illegal ones, uh, etc. So, uh, what the results of that uh, are uh, hate speeches, uh, fake news, uh, violence, and uh, people take the street and um, can be very violent. I have a number of examples of that everywhere in the world. And uh, part of these examples show that there is some, um, I would say, if not complicity, but some um, uh, em empathy uh, for such movements by um, th those leaders who are either um, very uh, blunt, if not rogue, uh, in, in their speeches, and, uh, uh, and some are in democracies. And some and others who are ruling uh, also countries and are ruling it with a very uh, with strength. So uh, the example I have here uh, are the white supremacists in uh, in in the United States, actually in uh, I guess in Carolina in 2017, and uh, the grey wolves uh, in uh, Turkey. And you see that with the hands you can make uh, uh, some sort of a, uh, representation of a wolf uh, and the interesting thing is that this idea of wolf is connected to strength to determination to uh, you know in a way you can be a wild uh, hero uh, if you use the symbol of a wolf we come uh, to um, this uh, particular uh, use of the uh, legend of the wolf uh, soon so this order is back that, that's something we are sure of. It's not only due to uh, the pandemic uh, and not even to previous pandemic, this uh, disorder is back. So uh, we had some order for a long period of time, as we have seen uh, in the last session, uh, uh, starting in 1815, etc., uh, and then restarted in, uh, in 1919 and 1945, uh, respectively. But but now it's clear that uh, this order is, is gaining momentum, that it's, it's everywhere and uh, we don't know how long it's going to last. So where this order uh, comes come from? It comes, it stems from, from actually the use and misuse of undemocratic and undiplomatic practice. Uh, in a democracy, uh, you know what the, the morals, what the uh, uses, what the customs, what the ways to behave or to express your views are, and uh, you know that everything else uh, can be taken as uh, some sort of an insult or a, a bias or a, something which is drifting away from whatever is established among civilized nations. So heinous speech, for example, uh, when they are uh, pronounced at the top of a state, uh, may encourage uh, or uh, uh, incite people to tolerate illegal and social practices by, by, by ordinary people, uh, grassroots. This in turn will make room for racketing and ransoming those who have money uh, because, you know, they are not going to be uh, they are stigmatized uh, as uh, people who make profit, uh, as do profit, as uh, allegedly, and people who are um, benefiting from uh, uh, some sort of, uh, of uh, rent uh, because uh, they are, for example, back to Greece. Uh, now, uh, if you are in tourism, then uh, you are the one who make money for the whole uh, country, and so that puts you in the uh, very unviable situation or envied situation in a way jealous situation and etc. So also you're a target. You're a target for uh, racketing and ransoming. And so uh, especially of course if you have a casino, but but not only. The language is becoming more and more undiplomatic, although it's called a diplomatic language. Uh, we have examples, uh, of course, with Trump in the USA. This is a very early uh, statement made by President Trump uh, once uh, uh, stepping in power about Iran. Uh, so, you know, we all 
know how obsessed he is by uh, Iran, but you know, when you uh, make such statements and you uh, are addressing people who are not exactly considered as fools, enemies, uh, uh, considering that they are fanatical um, and that uh, they raid the wealth of uh, other countries, they spread death, destruction, and chaos, that's something which is quite amazing. Uh, in diplomacy, uh, nobody used this type of language, but, but leaders of rogue states, uh, desperados like uh, Hitler or uh, Mussolini, uh, uh, etc., a long time ago, uh, fortunately. Now, uh, Trump and the Americans and uh, his counselors, advisors, uh, are not the only one to be very undiplomatic. Uh, you know, Chinese uh, were for a long period of time known for very being very cautious, uh, having uh, very mild uh, statements, uh, trying not to uh, harm anyone, uh, etc. That would be for long a characteristic of uh, the ambassadors of China, for example. And I met some, and I knew and know how they behave and what kind of. Uh, speech uh, they can have, etc. But now it's becoming more and more fashionable to be the defense, defend, to defend the, the, uh, uh, the doctrine or, or the vision of Xi Jinping and the Communist Party outside. Uh, and there was an expression coined by Chinese themselves, wolf warrior, again the wolf, the wolf is coming back uh, and barking, uh, the wolf warrior, um, because the, the, the wolf warrior can accuse um, publicly uh, with very harsh word uh, the uh, other uh, governments. And here you have an example about the US, uh, uh, which is of course uh, uh, very bold and, and completely unsubstantiated itself. So, uh, if you want to read uh, things like uh, uh, have examples of uh, type of insult, etc., when you can read it later. But uh, I mean, Trump says about President Macron of France, uh, he's a pain in the ass. Um, called to talked about his foolishness. Um, a Brazilian said that he had the colonialist, uh, lamentable, lamentable colonialist stance, etc. When you look at this uh, with a broader, uh, from a broader angle, uh, look um, at uh, political international events as if they were examples of uh, things that have been studied by anthropologists uh, in the world, uh, in, in very small communities, for example, in, o in Oceania. Um, big men uh, are the translation, approximate translation of uh, a term, a word which exists in most languages uh, in this area, and uh, words that uh, the depict uh, heads of a community, assuming that these heads are not as powerful uh, uh, our heads of states, heads of government are just because they don't want to have too much power accumulated in the hands of anyone. Uh, and that's basics in the organization of societies in the world, as I already told you. So here, the radical uh, solution is that uh, heads are only those who are uh, leading the community against uh, an aggressor uh, or protecting this community uh, uh, in terms of uh, having enough resources when these resources are uh, needed. Uh, if you look at uh, people like Putin, Erdogan, uh, Modi, Sisi uh, in Egypt, uh, Duterte in, in uh, the Philippines, etc., uh, you get the impression that they are uh, playing a role, acting, uh, you know, uh, it's kind of, kind of drama uh, in which they are comedians impersonating uh, these uh, big men, uh, uh, because they are new nationalists, so they, they are the voices of a community of people in which they were born, and uh, this is this idea of being born and born again in this community, is revival of the nativist ideology, which is very important at the roots of this type of uh, position and stances uh, taken by these uh, tough leaders. Um, when they are dealing with uh, their peers um, uh, elsewhere. 
and, and they also are protectionist. Um, but most of the time when you are not the neo nationalist, but you are uh, concerned with the sovereignty uh, of your people and of your territory, uh, even though you are a Democrat, then you may uh, com you may actually uh, adopt the type of uh, speech and, and the manners that uh, come from from these na neo nationalist leaders. Uh, so Boris Johnson, for example, in a way is, is uh, trying to be a copycat of Trump in a number of uh, fields, although he's quite different actually. Uh, and uh, Orban uh, in Hungary, Salvini in Italy are following suit, uh, which uh, is now some sort of a fashionable way to address uh, the, the uh, other leaders in one's own, own country. Here are the big men uh, who are illustrated uh, every day by statements that would have been considered decades ago as completely uh, despicable and, and, uh, and unbearable by anyone and certainly undiplomatic. Uh, Erdogan uh, in Turkey on the left, uh, in the center uh, Sisi uh, of Egypt, and on the right, Duterte of the Philippines. I mean, if you read the speeches uh, on the internet, there are many opportunities to uh, have a look at what they can uh, declare from time to time. It's incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, this is quite contrary to whatever the 18th and 19th century at the took so long a time to build uh, in order to make the relationship between different countries civilized, tamed, or uh, at least moderated for, 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 for decades and even for centuries. Uh, I like this uh, caricature uh, uh, because uh, this shows that uh, you, know, you, you, you are like a wrestler, uh, not a, like a diplomat. I mean, uh, and then people are, the spectators are, are uh, uh, watching the, the, the fight and they are applauding the winner, uh, are trying to uh, encourage uh, the one who is in, a, in, in jeopardy in such a fight. Um, are we condemned the now to have uh, uh, the planet um, actually ruled and by, by people who are behaving like this, that's, that, that's a question for the future because, I mean, there are a number of uh, new leaders who emerge here and there and they don't seem to uh, try to c copy uh, the heads of state and governments who are respected for uh, their moderation, like Angela Merkel. But they are more like Putin, uh, as Putin or, uh, or, or, or Trump. So, what a big man is exactly uh, if you move from Oceania, uh, when the, where the, the, the word was invented, to, to, to Russia, for example. Well, he's a man. A man has manly manners, uh, and uh, some of them are in Oceania, the big men are polygamous for one reason, that they need uh, the, the women to work hard. It's like a team to produce uh, agricultural resources uh, that will be shared with the community. So it's a necessity, it's functional, uh, it's, there is nothing to do about uh, profiting from the situation and harassing women. It's a social organization, the social structure. But now if you look at people like Trump, I mean, they are very uh, happy to let people know that they can, could seduce quite a number of uh, beautiful women and uh, probably uh, for some of them uh, at the same time. And not only success. So uh, they also show more seriously that are attached to traditions and to local culture. The local culture is supposed to uh, be um, threatened by the cosmopolitanism of a number of new uh, emerging uh, characters uh, like migrants, like, uh, uh, like uh, refugees, like uh, uh, people who do not b belong to the same religion, uh, for example, Muslims who arrive uh, um, massively uh, when there is a crisis in Syria across the uh, Mediterranean and then uh, eventually uh, are living in uh, Germany uh, or Sweden or uh, Mexican and uh, even farther 
uh, people coming from Southern America uh, who uh, succeed in uh, eventually uh, crossing the, 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 the wall or the boundary of the fence between Mexico and the United States and uh, settled uh, uh, in the state somewhere, California, New Mexico, Arizona, whatever. Uh, so you have to protect the local culture. And so Putin, for example, is very much attached to orthodoxy, the churches, uh, the local villages, Dacha culture and whatsoever. Uh, and um, uh, in the uh, United States, um, you can say the same thing about uh, Trump and uh, folklore uh, of the United States uh, in the South, uh, for example, the deep South of, the, of, of America. They also display signs of virility, you know, for example, the, the uh, Mao Zedong was uh, famous because at a very uh, advanced age, uh, he, he, he swimmed in the Yangtze uh, in winter or something like this. And so there were, there were photographs of him doing this and that was a proof of his, of his uh, virility, the proof that he was strong and he was a real man. Uh, that's, uh, in a way, uh, signs of uh, machismo, uh, uh, obviously. But that means that these people can be determined. You can rely on them because they, you know, they are strong, they are determined, and uh, they have a strong personality. That's an interesting point because the, the, most of these people viewed uh, by a psychologist share a number of personality traits that have very recently identified. And when you say that it's a personality trait, it means that in the large population, you can uh, put people into boxes uh, and uh, say that there are some who are, for example, more open to the other, some who are uh, more uh, self-oriented. There are people who are, are cautious of everything and meticulous and uh, never happy with uh, whatever they do. Uh, to protect themselves from a uh, dangerous outside world, and also who are risk-taking, etc. So you have a number of qualifications for uh, such people, but the latest uh, uh, typology uh, is a, a typology which is called the dark triad. Dark because, of course, these uh, characteristics are not uh, very uh, acceptable, uh, which uh, is composed of people who are um, Machiavellians, people who are psychopaths and people who are narcissists. And so, you know, if you're a Machiavellian, you manipulate people. If you're a psychopath, you just want to have power and control, and take control over everyone else. And if you are a narcissist, uh, you really want to be uh, recognized, to be uh, supported, to be loved. Uh, by, by the others and you have a high uh, level of self-esteem and you think that the, you need proofs from uh, the uh, outside world and the rest of the population that, that you deserve uh, this uh, reputation and this recognition. And so these this, this, this three types are probably more adapted to big men than, uh, for instance, uh, uh, being uh, uh, maniacally meticulous or uh, being risk-taking um, for the sake of the whole uh, population, for example. If, if I may jump in here, um, yes. we're still waiting uh, for questions, if anybody's got a question. Uh, but just on that point, um, you know, we've seen quite a few articles writing about female leaders um, who've been essentially more risk averse, I think. So Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, uh, Mutti, Angela Merkel up in Germany, um, the, their approaches have been far more successful in this sort of uh, crisis situation. OK, here we have two, uh, actually two theories. One is that when women are in uh, power positions, they um, are more cautious, they consult uh, more people. Uh, they uh, they uh, they listen to advice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because um, actually, um, they, they they think that it's, you know where you are in power, you can misuse power. So they, they they want to be certain that they don't do that. That's one theory. The other theory is that once you achieve. Uh, uh, you step in power somewhere and it's very difficult to reach that position like Margaret Thatcher, uh, Golda Meir, uh, India Gandhi, uh, etc. You behave exactly as a man. Uh, and even sometimes uh, it, it's even more uh, uh, 
virile uh, that, 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 than if, you, if they were male people, uh, uh, men, because because the, the position itself, uh, if you if you are able to reach that position, it means that you behaved like a man earlier. Uh, so we, we don't know what what's what is the truth actually. Uh, and and also there are also people who say the first fit type of theory is a mix of the two, saying that if it's a pandemic, so it's about a disease, the disease you know like the nurse, um, uh, the nurse uh, paradigm. Uh, women are nurses, they are they are caring. Uh, so when it is about care, they are much better uh, and much more successful than men. Ah, okay, that's a possibility. Uh, I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, you yeah, certainly, uh, Margaret Thatcher was certainly seen to be a strong leader, and it would be it would be interesting to know how she would have approached this particular crisis. We have got a question about. Um, giant data companies. So uh, perhaps ask that right at the end uh, if there are other questions, but if you'd like to uh, continue. OK, we'll press okay. on. OK, okay. thanks. OK. So um, as I said, these, these leaders do not consult or if they do, they don't uh, take advice. Actually, um, you cannot convince them easily, uh, even though you have sound and rational arguments and uh, evidence uh, to provide. And this is exactly uh, the uh, uh, the type of of, of, of role which uh, is assigned to big men actually in primitive societies. Uh, primitive society, you know, forget about the word primitive. Um, this is how anthropologists used to um, depict uh, isolated, uh, unpopulated, and illiterate society where the culture is um, verbal, oral. Uh, and people uh, move from one place to the next. There are no landmarks. They, uh, they don't build uh, in stone, uh, 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 and they don't need actually uh, uh, written uh, text uh, or even history. Uh, so this is what the anthropologists call a primitive society. Now, I would say probably uh, an isolated society whatsoever that would be more politically correct. But if we uh, just use this as a, some sort of a, uh, shortcut for, for this type of society. These societies are characterized by the fact that the heads of this society have to provide resources to their people and have to protect their people against other people. So they are both provider and protector. So if you are a head there, you're a provider and a protector. If you look at uh, Xi Jinping or, uh, or uh, Modi, I mean, if you provide a uh, rate of growth which is uh, uh, higher than eight, nine, or ten percent, then uh, you are um, performing well uh, as far as providing resources concerned. Now, if you give the people the impression that you are investing uh, in the army, that you uh, build um, sophisticated weapons, that you can go to the moon, uh, etc. You are the protector of the, of the people. And that's, of course, it's at the roots of uh, nationalistic societies where people uh, stick together because they think that they belong to a society which is not only emerging, rising, but it's also consolidating compared to the others. And so they have a high level of self-esteem themselves. That means that big men are possible and uh, strong uh, men uh, today are possible because the people are supportive of uh, their uh, way to, uh, to act and to speak. Uh, there is some complicity between these politicians uh, who, who are more or less rogue most of the time and rank and file people um, because uh, because there is some empathy uh, between the two. Uh, a wrong man is also a, an ordinary man. And I'm like you. Um, so you could be in my place and you would do exactly the same or you would speak in the same way. So the language I, I use is your language. I mean, you're, usually people in my position don't uh, speak like this. They, they are more diplomatic. Uh, they are more democratic. They are more, uh, they have more concern and consideration for uh, not harming anyone. Uh, but uh, uh, you, the people, uh, you, when you speak, you don't speak like this. I mean, you are, of course, insulting other people. You are uh, lambasting uh, some uh, someone, uh, etc. So, um, so I do the same. I'm 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 like you. I'm one of yours, um, and so I'm a normal fellow. Uh, 
So that's the contradiction of these people who are considered as hero and they do everything they can to uh, actually consolidate their legend as a as a mythological hero. But at the same time, they say, well, I'm completely normal, fully normal, you know, I'm behaving exactly as you do. I'm eating the same type of thing, even though it's considered by people who are expert in health as bad for health, etc. No problem. Too much cholesterol, no problem. We are strong. We can afford this. Um, but that also means that if I am uh, an ordinary man, uh, I'm neither an intellectual, because intellectuals pretend, you know, claim, uh, assert that they are different from ordinary people, they are above ordinary people. I'm not a liberal, someone who also wants to impose his or her views about uh, how tolerant we should be to things which are against our traditional culture, etc. Uh, I understand people uh, concerns better than anyone else. Probably I, I also build my legion uh, saying that uh, I am a life which is very uh, uh, similar to the life of anyone uh, average uh, citizen in my country. Uh, and I can get along quite well with crowds. Uh, I shake hands with people I don't know. I'm, uh, I like to go and visit people and uh, uh, be applauded, uh, etc. And I, I mix with a number of uh, strangers everywhere. Uh, and, and this is why I'm considered also as a strong man because I survived this. Uh, so is it a strong man's momentum, which of course means that uh, the uh, relationship uh, between the governments will be more and more difficult because the heads of these governments or the heads of uh, the states uh, represented in international organizations or in international negotiation venues will be, of course, uh, vying for power and uh, wrestling against each other instead of discussing what kind of solutions can be uh, found uh, out in the end and, and, and finding compromises. So, so uh, the advantage of being a strong leader is that, of course, you don't uh, take uh, great care of uh, consulting, so you make the decision yourself and you implement them without, uh, again, uh, any uh, regard for, for uh, side effects and uh, whatever will happen, unfortunately, to some people, uh, because this was not planned well in advance uh, with a consideration for uh, the uh, uh, unexpected and undesirable uh, impact uh, on, on the rest of the population. You also have little consideration for international commitments. That's a characteristic uh, in, that they have in common, all these leaders, uh, that uh, when they are crossing uh, their borders and they go to places where there are other uh, people coming from uh, other countries, uh, they are even uh, more uh, uh, they uh, behave in a harsh, uh, more harsh way uh, than usual. Uh, they, they, they set up the tone and then they, uh, they speak up. Uh, um, so they show that they don't care uh, about international commitment. I come back to this in the uh, third part of the course, actually. Uh, they, when doing this, it's exactly uh, they, they were on the, on the wrong side, uh, viewed from Democrats and people who believe in diplomacy and compromise, uh, because they uh, um, are siding with the, the people who are uh, targeted by international laws, because they are culprits, they are guilty of something. Um, and the international organizations, when they uh, uh, establish norms, which constraints uh, governments and, uh, and, and administrations and, and police force, etc., elsewhere, and, and armies are also considered as uh, being the uh, responsible for, for the lack of freedom. Uh, and so I'm siding with you because you are the victims of this international organization. So this is absolutely uh, nasty because you are. Uh, at the roots of these international organizations, you are part of the international negotiations which are uh, currently uh, running somewhere. And at the same time, you say, uh, well, you, I'm not exactly as any other uh, negotiator. I am like the other people who are outside and who feel concerned with whatever we come out from these international negotiations. So it's, uh, uh, in a way, it's having a double talk. And, uh, and and that's 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 not very good for an international rule, which would be smoothly um, uh, organized, etc. If 
if we take the COVID-19, uh, it's, 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 it's probably uh, an opportunity to support uh, the uh, strongest uh, leaders. Why? Uh, because, you know, in democracy, uh, decisions are long to make. Uh, and uh, there are uh, hedges, uh, checks and balances. Uh, that means that, of course, it takes time to go all along uh, this process, muddle through all these obstacles uh, that are in the way of a democratic uh, head of state or government trying to reach a decision. Uh, and so when people are uh, suffering from uh, emergency uh, and uh, are facing a danger, which is which is very uh, urgent to um, uh, to stop, uh, they they call for strong leadership. They want their leaders to be strong and to make decisions immediately. Uh, and that was visible uh, everywhere, uh, including in Great Britain. If you remember, Boris Johnson uh, first uh, believed in uh, the herd type of vaccination, uh, the whole population in Great Britain, letting people uh, being uh, infected and uh, and see what will come out. Uh, and then change his uh, policy and lock down uh, the whole population for a long period of time than any other uh, countries in Europe. Uh, so this is uh, proof that uh, even someone who is has a reputation of being strong, when he acts with uh, more caution and uh, seems to be uh, more respect, respect, uh, respecting uh, democratic measures and uh, and uh, human rights and uh, rights to pri privacy, etc. In the end, uh, is even criticized and has to change his mind and become stronger again. Um, uh, now, the interesting thing is that lockdowns, which stopped every type of activity and uh, ruined a number of people, have been better accepted worldwide than uh, tracing individuals and uh, knowing who is infecting uh, so possibly could infect other people with uh, at, at what pace and uh, um, with what type which with which type of outcome uh, number of people infected etc the famous r0 zero, zero. so uh, and those people the leader who hesitated uh, and were actually um, uh, not uh, sure uh, about which policy measure should be uh, have been sanctioned by a deep fall of popularity as measured by um, opinion polls uh, everywhere and uh, uh, and even those who were immune um, from that like Boris Johnson for a while are now suffering from this uh, same fall uh, of popularity so when you call for uh, a str for a strong leader, you want leader, diplomatic leader, a democratic leader, to stronger uh, to display strength. That means that democracy is actually threatened in a way, or it could be weakened. Um, if uh, the leaders are judged as good leaders when they don't reach agreements with others because they are supposed to refuse to make compromise uh, for the sake of uh, their own population, their own constituents. So that's also uh, the roots of a decline of diplomacy, because diplomacy is made of competition between people in a way against the constituents who elected those who are making the compromises and go out, uh, step out of a negotiation room thinking that, well, it could have been worse. Heads of international organization, uh, of course, because they uh, are uh, belonging to organizations founded by states, can never be as strong as head of state of governments. There are quite a number of them who are completely unknown to the population everywhere, uh, completely unknown. Uh, some of them are more charismatic and uh, manage to be uh, famous or become famous, especially uh, when there is a crisis. And of course, the Secretary General of the United Nations is most of the time, not every time, uh, more uh, famous worldwide than any other heads of an organization, international organization. Well, who knows, for example, who is at the head of the World Trade Organization, and not to speak of the UN World Tourism Organization. So uh, they cannot be as uh, as as, as uh, famous as heads of state or government, not as powerful as they are. Uh, they don't have a reputation to be powerful, a British a reputation to be negotiating and to be compromising and reaching for consensus. And there is a competition between these two uh, possibilities to stand 
answers uh, the, uh, the the mildest way and the strongest way to uh, to negotiate. The uh, strong uh, heads of national states are not only to be found in autocratic regimes. So you find also uh, strong men in democratic uh, regimes. Uh, and uh, they have an opportunity to express uh, their views and be become popular for doing this uh, among their own people. Um, but because the, 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 the new uh, places or the new centers of decision making uh, for which are impact globalization are more restricting or exclusive clubs like the G7, the G20, um, places where um, the strong leaders may have uh, their moments, like uh, Trump uh, in the G7, uh, or Boris Johnson, and on the other hand, on G20, uh, the Russian, the Turkish, the, uh, um, the Brazilian, the, the Chinese, etc. So they benefit from uh, the fact that uh, a more inclusive forum, in which everyone uh, uh, is uh, uh, as a voice and uh, literally on an equal footing with the others, uh, like the United Nations General Assembly. Uh, they they are they are actually more less less um, uh, influent than than they were in the past. Um, uh, this is particularly true with the uh, UN General Assembly, by the way, because people know whatever comes out from the UN Security Council. Uh, and this seems to be implemented from time to time, not all the times actually. But about the General Assembly, it seems to be just you know, uh, you 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 make speeches and uh, uh, promises or whatever, but never uh, nothing happens. Nothing uh, is never implemented. So the question is um, probably distrust is now uh, in a way subverting the reputation of uh, organization that were in the past considered as uh, being more and more important, prominent and, uh, and helpful. Um, and there was a lot, if you looked at the opinion polls made in a number of countries uh, decades ago, uh, the UN, the European Union, uh, even the WTO, uh, and of course, the UNHCR and others were considered as an organization uh, in which you can uh, have a lot of confidence, uh, much more than, for example, your own national institutions, governments, uh, parliaments, uh, political parties, etc. Now, it's probably the other way around today. Um, and you have examples of it because, for example, China, um, in a way, still uh, remains at the threshold of uh, the uh, uh, core uh, countries uh, which are able to make decisions within the ASEAN. Uh, the US is reluctant to uh, go on playing its uh, role in NATO. Um, uh, Great Britain uh, withdrew from the European Union, but uh, African countries uh, which actually supported the creation of the International Criminal Court at the very beginning in the 2000s are now pulling out of this organization because they think that it's uh, uh, not a racist organization, but it's uh, actually stigmatizing a number of African leaders. France uh, uh, put out from UNIDO, the, the United Nations Agency for the Industrialization and Development uh, in Vienna uh, two years ago. Uh, USA is uh, pulled out from military treaties. The last one, uh, the last um, withdrawal was uh, three days ago uh, from uh, Open Sky Agreement. I'll come back to it in the third part. And Nigeria suddenly, uh, in a single day, uh, declared that uh, the country would pull out from 90 international organizations. 90, not nine, 90. Uh, there are people who freeze their participation uh, because of some events that they consider as uh, discriminating against them, uh, like uh, the UK, US and Israel in UNESCO. The US suspended its contribution to the WHO and is threatening the WHO to abandon it uh, if uh, not, not, no reform is envisaged and, uh, and uh, implemented soon. Uh, and uh, they, they, they are also uh, uh, successful attempts uh, to change uh, some organization uh, revised their institutions and their design 
like the US did with uh, North American Free Trade uh, Association, the NAFTA. Um, but this is compensated by another trend. We also see that every government which is not yet a member of an international organization, and sometimes uh, like within with the WTO, it's a more or less a selective organization and you have to apply and be admitted by those who are already in and it's a long around series of rounds of negotiations before you succeed. And so they are still uh, actually um, uh, queuing for, for being admitted. Quite a number of organizations in which they are not already part. Business associations do the same. Um, and uh, finally, um, they found out that it's uh, more successful, more, more efficient to uh, lobby a regional organization like the EU rather than lobbying the national governments within the EU. Because uh, if it comes from the top in the realms in which the EU has uh, actually uh, enough competence, actually legal competence, of course, not uh, in other realms, uh, then uh, if you succeed in obtaining from the EU Commission some uh, advantage, then uh, uh, the advantage will be replicated in each member of the European Union. Uh, and also there is another uh, trend uh, which you have to consider because this is not in the newspaper. It's the fact that behind closed doors, all these people who have, have adopted uh, uh, very uh, bold uh, and blunt type of uh, speeches uh, uh, worldwide, uh, stating things uh, in an insulting way, etc., um, become very, very uh, uh, cooperative, and uh, they 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 use logical argument and, and not uh, are not displaying any signs of uh, passionate attitude. Uh, uh, which of course is a source of charisma home, but uh, which is not a way to reach an agreement uh, abroad. Now, uh, there was a first strike by the governments, states, but the IOs are able to strike back. Uh, this is a good example, IATA, International Air Transport Association, which is a business association, semi-private, uh, quasi and uh, non-governmental organization. Uh, of course, uh, the, the, the such organization pulled their resources in order to be stronger uh, and to be able to confront uh, the states or regional organization like the EU, but they also do it uh, crossing sectors and associating public and private institutions, which empower them in the end. Uh, Yata, for example, is uh, the author of quite a number of reports, actually uh, nearly every week there is a new report, and also nicely uh, worded, like uh, biosecurity for air transport. You know, it's not about uh, making profit uh, in air transport because that would be less uh, uh, sexy uh, for for the people they would like to reach. Um, and they have this idea of roadmaps. Now, roadmaps uh, is you know helpful. Uh, you contribute to solve uh, problems. Uh, Yata uh, select benchmarks and make norms for airlines and airport. And they have, for example, two, just two examples of what they do, a passenger facilitation program and a travel standards board, uh, because that would be adapted to the current pandemic. Uh, so they are very active and they collaborate with a number of other organizations, which are intergovernmental inter organization and not business association. Um, they also have task forces uh, specific to uh, issues which have to be settled internationally because they cannot be settled locally um, and countries belong to these groups, uh, all groups or some, several groups and uh, in the end they are able to reach uh, uh, standards and the standards are applied everywhere. Um, and that would be, of course, possible uh, with the help of new technologies. So also, they look innovative. Uh, Yata is mainly lobbying uh, governments, uh, especially, for example, in Europe, the uh, European Union as well, and also international organizations like uh, UN uh, World Tourism Organization, uh, Custom Organization, and others. 
to do this, they they use uh, every type of argument. We have seen already a, a political argument. You, you could see a political argument when you read the previous slides uh, uh, home uh, quietly after this course, after the session. Uh, political argument saying that you you made it after 9-11, so you can make it after the COVID crisis. But they also have convincing economic arguments like, you know, without us, uh, the world is not going to, uh, to the, the world is going to be in, in, in the great jeopardy. I mean, the economy uh, will uh, be uh, victims of crunches everywhere and, and going to crash. Um, because more or a third of global trade moves by air. So that's, that's, of course, very, very telling for those who hear this. But they also have innovative uh, uh, suggestions like the immunity passport, which is very much debated by now by governments and by international organizations. And uh, we are not sure that it's going to have a bright future, uh, which is that uh, uh, people could have this uh, uh, passport uh, proving that they can travel safely and uh, not uh, infecting, uh, contaminating the others. Well, now the, 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 the last question is that uh, the, if you have so many nationalist rulers and strong, strong people who are the heads of uh, a number of states, um, uh, what will happen to the architecture of the world? I mean, this architecture, as we have seen, was made of diplomats. It was really a constructive, collaborative, cooperative, etc. So uh, let's have the Americans as an example. Um, the American predicament is that they, they, they make the world. I mean, they made the world in 1918 and then they, they, they did not even uh, became members of the League of Nations. They made the world in uh, 1944, uh, San Francisco, uh, the Bretton Woods, and then 45, San, San Francisco Conference for the UN, 248 uh, with the creation of the GATT, and 1994, the creation of the WTO. And then, and then, uh, they do not stop weakening the institution they had created. And sometimes even pull out from the withdrawal from the institutions, uh, which uh, in the end could, of course, uh, ruin the whole diplomatic architecture of the world. So they build the world and then they just ruin the world that they had built. Uh, the, the, the contradiction is not only on the American side, there is an American contradiction on the, on the global north side, uh, because the West is at the roots, not only the Americans, at the roots of the uh, international system that we know. Um, and so now this international system must also uh, be helpful to the rest of the world, not only the West. Uh, this idea of uh, having one planet and one planet only, a planet for all, uh, is uh, also a contradiction because uh, we don't know if the global north and global south will progressively converge, uh, meaning that they will be in a win-win situation or, or not. And we don't know if global public goods, like the future vaccine against COVID-19, be offered to mankind by governments, which are, on the other hand, very nationalist. For example, the Chinese government is nationalist government they also say that they will offer freely a uh, vaccine if they uh, are the first to uh, find uh, this uh, solution to the COVID-19 to the whole world. But that, of course, is a, is a contradiction. Um, when nativist rulers are vying for global power everywhere, I'm nearly uh, finished. Um, okay, I'm nearly finished, Stuart. You have to unmute your microphone. But yeah, I love, OK, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're right on time. Yeah, if you'd like to continue for a couple of minutes, well, I, and there's I, one question. Um, OK, I, you made me lost my my, oh, right. my presentation, my presentation. So I have to find it again. <laughs> Where is it? It's it's oh, like, it was actually up there. Um, but it was, but it's, it's no longer there. Oh. All right. Yeah. No longer there. Let's see where it is. Sorry about that. Few seconds and it will be all right. Okay, here it is. So uh, uh, you, you know, it's it's difficult to imagine that we will reach a stage where we have world government because of these divisions. Uh, and also, it's difficult to imagine that international organizations can ever uh, overwhelm states, which because uh, the conditions to meet before we reach a high level of regulations are not uh, um, uh, we are not very um, are not ready 
to meet these conditions, as it's, it's shown in this uh, slide. Uh, we can't, can't see the slide, I don't think. You can't see the slide? No. no. Aha. Okay. I'm not sure what happened to it. Because uh, there was a... Um... Okay, now we can. You can. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Now you can. And I'm nearly finished, actually. So, uh, what was the rule before 1815, uh, which was, was uh, the absence of uh, any supranational norm, uh, should have become outdated if we would like to reach uh, the, the more advanced stage of regulation at world level. Uh, and uh, this was called anarchy by, by scholars, meaning that uh, uh, what works within national boundaries, uh, authority, enforcement, etc., does not work outside. You cannot force states to do things they don't want to do. Uh, this is exactly what uh, Trump's illustrate when he says America is first to make America great again. Uh, and the, the last uh, the condition to meet is uh, that hierarchy uh, cannot actually uh, um, solve the, uh, the problem because uh, the pyramid of norms, with uh, norms above, norms in the middle, and then norm uh, at the bottom, um, uh, is, is, is uh, with an, an one, only one paramount source of, of global norms, it's not going to accommodate the demands from the South and the demands from the poor or demands from the less resourceful. Uh, what can do that is what is called polyarchy. Polyarchy means that a number, several, several uh, states, uh, several powers, several enemies are uh, ruling the world, uh, more or less, together. Uh, and so, in a way, they balance their own power, but they also are like-minded, so they can try to reach some sort of a solution for the world and, uh, um, and help uh, people from different origins coexist and uh, actually uh, adapt uh, and adopt, adopt their, 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 their cultures, their norms, their values, and incorporate all this into a universal type of uh, uh, values and, and, and the system of norms. Um, this is exactly what we'll see uh, in the next uh, session, uh, the type of polyarchy, uh, polyarchical government. Uh, and uh, this is the end of this session with a couple of minutes late. OK, and the next session is actually on Tuesday, not Monday as usual. Um, just uh, one question that came in from Bardia, which is about um, whether how you regard sh any sort of shift in authority from governments to the uh, tech giants like uh, Google, Baidu, Amazon, um, you know, who are basically um, using a lot of data about um, our lives. You know, they've got masses of data about who we are and what we're doing. Um, how do you, so the question is, how do you examine this shift of power uh, specifically after this pandemic, which forces us to uh, rely more, rely on technological Yeah, but technology, sorry, yeah? Yeah, so uh, how, do you, how do you regard that shift in authority, uh, if you do? Well, I do. Uh, I think that there is a shift in authority, but not in the action that seems to be pointed out by your by, by the question. Uh, I mean, governments are going to retrieve their authority uh, on uh, the GAFA because uh, so far they let them do uh, and uh, they did not make any attempt to control uh, the Internet, the, the use of the Internet by these big corporations. Uh, now, uh, there is a rule, absolute rule in the private sector. When you have a business, Whatever is and uh, makes you um, make money uh, or find a new market or gaining market share, you're going to do it. But once it's forbidden, it's forbidden. It's forbidden for everyone. So it's forbidden for you, it's forbidden for your competitors as well. So I'm sure that uh, the governments will say this is permitted and this is forbidden in a realm where they did not do much about trying to. Uh, make a distinction uh, between uh, uh, between uh, normal behavior and uh, uh, dangerous uh, uh, drifting away from from 
from what would be preferable for the people and for, for the government. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that, very optimistic. They, they, there, will be a, there will be some sort of a cooperation because, you know, business don't like, the people who are in business don't like to be um, left with the, 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 the burden of interpreting what is actually or will be in the future, not only now, but will remain for long a load. So they want to know, well, for example, uh, um, the uh, junk bonds, well, as, as long as you can have junk bonds, exchange junk bonds, buy them, sell them or whatsoever, you'll do it because you think that you get some profit from it. Uh, and there are no signs that's going to be interrupted by by the governments, your own governments, the United States government, all of us, all international organizations. When you think that it's becoming to be more and more of a problem, then you would like all your competitors uh, to be uh, uh, stopped and uh, not being able to continue doing this. And in the long run, you benefit from the new norm, whereas this new norm is in a way forbidding you something to do something. So I'm optimistic. A lot of the uh, innovation seems to come in those gray areas and that uh, you know, technology moves so quickly that, uh, you know, they can, I mean, it takes a long time for the regulators to catch up, basically. It's also because the, the whole system has been conceived that way. I mean, uh, they, they assume that if uh, the people who have enough imagination and uh, good uh, technological skills, uh, then uh, something profitable for all will come out. Uh, of their innovation, uh, innovative action. But uh, at some point, now you get an idea of the architecture, and then now the next step is, what's the best uh, form of governance uh, for, for this realm? And uh, the best governance is a public-private governance. It's going to be only a private one, because I mean, no market is working without the contribution of the public authorities. Even the freest market in the world are, are actually made free by the public authorities, which makes this possible. And from time to time, uh, put uh, some uh, uh, and, uh, put an end to uh, some sort of uh, um, a, 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 the, the from, from the fact that that that, that the, the market uh, operators are, are drifting away from from the usual ways to do business uh, and so no I, I think that the private sector like public norms as uh, as long as these public norms are clear you don't have to interpret and they are the same for every every competitor and so by now it's a mess it's a mess because the terms of service of uh, Amazon for example or Google or uh, Apple so I can, can in a way uh, not exactly be the same uh, it's a problem for them more than a problem for us, the end users. But we have seen um, social media having a per pernicious impact in terms of uh, politics. You know, fake news, um, people essentially believing anything that's out there on social media. Yeah. And, and having a direct influence on democracy. That's right. That's right. And uh, so th there is a need, for example, to regulate um, uh, hate speech. Uh, and there are calls for that. And um, as I said uh, last time in the uh, recommendation of the experts uh, and the group of experts uh, to which I belong, to the, uh, um, the heads of state and government uh, who will meet in, uh, in Washington, either virtually or in Camp David uh, face to face, we don't know yet. Uh, one of the recommendations is about this and have a charter which says what is permitted not to say and post on the internet in whatever platform uh, and uh, be it uh, an image, a photograph, a text or whatsoever. And also specifically about uh, hate speech and just uh, um, stigmatizing uh, some others just because of what they are and not because of things they said or did. Uh, that would be a big difference because by now, you know, it's just that if I kill someone uh, in front of my camera and I put it on the on the internet, then after 17 minutes or 20 minutes, it could it will be kept out uh, of the of the internet by a moderator somewhere. Can you imagine that the moderator has 2,000 um, images to see uh, in a, about an hour? If you work eight hours a day facing a screen like this, 
you get crazy. Uh, and so you're not always able to do it. It takes time to, to identify what is violent, what is a sign of hatred, um, and so on. So they don't have the, the right tools. So if the government says that's the right tools, that's the norms now, just adapt. They will. I suppose that's where artificial intelligence machine learning comes in um, in order Possibly. to analyze that sort of thing quickly and now algorithms as was mentioned by Bardia. Anyway I think we'd better wrap it up because we're about 11 minutes over. Um, okay. Thanks a lot for the presentation and uh, the next session will be on Tuesday at okay. 11 o'clock. Okay. Okay. So see you then. Bye bye. Okay bye. Bye everyone.